But also the thing that's so interesting about the psilocybin experiences is that they reliably produce mystical experiences that the people rate as among the most important experiences of their life and among those who have the psychedelic experience positive things happen to them and so that kind of messes with the whole psychosis theory, right? because what are you going to do? you're going to claim that you give someone a pill and they have a psychotic break and then they're healthier it's like, no, that isn't how psychotic breaks work you're not healthier after having one you're like, you're a broken egg and it's not easy to put you back together so, and we know that people all over the world have discovered every manner of psychedelic substance that you could possibly well, you imagine there's lots of hungry people wandering the earth for a long time and they ate every damn thing they could get their hands on and now and then something very peculiar happened as a consequence <laughs> so so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the shamanic uh, tradition because it's associated with Jacob's Ladder so, um, According to Iliada, Mircea Iliada, who was a great historian of religion, a, a compatriot of Jung's, and, and, and they influenced each other quite substantially. Iliada believed that shamanism that used psychedelics was a degeneration from the original, more pure shamanism. But I think later scholarship has demonstrated that that's incorrect, that, that the shamanic ritual per se was a direct consequence of the use, discovery of, and, and ritualistic use of psychedelic substances. But anyways, Iliada identified three pathways to shamanism, and the shaman in a, in a tribe was more educated than the typical person, with a larger vocabulary, and was the repository of the oral tradition, and so learned all the stories that had been passed down word to mouth, and people, by the way, are very, very can very, very accurately tell the same story across generations, that's been quite well documented, so and, and people who can't read really can remember, because what else are they going to do? Their memories are, are far greater than modern people's memories, because we, we can forget everything because we can just look it up. But they remembered things, because they had no choice. My father knew someone who was uh, illiterate and, 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 and couldn't use numbers either when, when he grew up in Saskatchewan, you know, 60 years ago. And he was a... He had sheep, if I remember correctly, and although he couldn't count, he knew if one of his sheep was missing. Because he knew all the sheep, and so he could tell just by looking if one of the sheep was missing, but he couldn't count. And so, well, so people who don't have our particular set of skills, first of all, they're not stupid, and second, they have other skills that we don't understand to, to fill in the gaps. So, Eliade identified spontaneous vocation, so you were just... You had the spirit of a shaman, let's say, so you're probably extremely high in openness, let's say, from a modern perspective. Hereditary transmission, so, you know, your father was a shaman and your grandfather was a shaman and so forth, and you got initiated into that process, or a personal quest. Uh, in Siberia, this is from Eliade, in Siberia, the youth who is called to be a shaman attracts attention by his strange behavior. For example, he seeks solitude, becomes absent-minded, loves to roam in the woods or unfrequented places, has visions and sings in his sleep. You know, if you put someone in a, in a place that's deprived, that's where you're, you're deprived from a sensory perspective, it, it, normal people will hallucinate quite quickly. So it seems what happens is that if you dampen down the sensory input, then you start to become aware of the background processes of your mind. It's something like that. It's like the signal-to-noise ratio. i, I got to get this right. As the noise decreases, some of the noise becomes signal, the background noise becomes signal, and you start to become aware of your own internal psychological processes, it's something like that. He has visions and sings in his sleep. In some instances, this period of incubation is marked by quite serious symptoms. Among the Yakut, the young man sometimes has fits of fury and easily loses consciousness, hides in the forest, feeds on the bark of trees, throws himself into water and fire, and cuts himself with knives. We went to a potlatch in northern, on northern Vancouver Island about a year ago, and they had this one dance, it was the Kwakwakwa natives, and they had this interesting dance that was the dance of the wild man, and so um, the person who invited us was the wild man, and he was dressed up in, in tree branches and so forth, and so he was the person who'd been in the bush too long, and he came in as a cannibal, and there, there was genuine cannibalistic rites among these people, not so long ago. He came in as a cannibal and everybody had to wear this like cedar headdress because if you had a cedar headdress on then the cannibal wouldn't take a bite out of you. And They actually took this rather seriously so 
you should have your cedar headdress on. And so he's looking around the crowd, and there's like 400 people in this place, and he could really act too. And so he's doing this wild man dance. And then all the women stood up and started to kind of dance in place and sing, and they were taming him. So that was really cool, you know, it was really interesting to see that, because those people are about, they've had an unbroken culture for about 13,000 years, eh? That's how long they've been out, out, out on the island there. And it was very interesting to see that dramatization of the domestication of, of man by women laid out in that dance, in that way. But it was also interesting in relationship to the shamanic tradition, because he came in as a wild man, right, and he had to be re-civilized in some sense and brought back down to earth. So, but by whatever method he may have been designated, a shaman is recognized as such only after having received two methods of instruction. The first is ecstatic, dreams, trances, visions. The other thing that this guy told me, and, and I have no reason to doubt him, um, he's also not a literate person, um, and so has a great memory. He does carving, traditional carving, and he's very good at it. He carved a 53-foot totem pole that's now in front of the Mu Museum of Art, in, in downtown Montreal. So if you ever go there, you can go see it. Uh, it won't be there forever, but it's there right now. And uh, he was taught to carve by his grandparents, and he said that he dreamed in, you know, you know what the Haida images look like, so the Kwakwakawaks are kind of like the Haida, same sort of imagery. He told me that he dreamed in those images. So when he dreams, that's the form that the things he dreams about takes, and he also said that he would talk to his grandparents in his dream, so if he was working on a piece of wood and trying to figure out how to carve it, and he ran into a particularly difficult problem, he'd dream and his, he'd have a conversation with his grandparents and they'd help him figure out how to solve the problem, and then he'd wake up and he could go carve the... And the thing is, he told me these things sort of matter-of-factly, right? Like, you know, you know what I mean? It, it wasn't like he was telling me these weird things that happened to him, although he was doing that to some degree. He, I asked him, a lot of questions about what he carved and what it all meant and um, you know that was just part of his explanation of how he did it and he he carved me a couple of doors that I have in my house and one of them is quite interesting well the two make a panel and they're an underwater scene and under the water there's a bunch of you know mythical monsters some of them are killer whales and I think there's an octopus down there and carved in this particular style and he said that the other thing that happens to him when he dreams is he goes down to the bottom of the water where these mythical creatures are and he gets inspiration from them. And so I thought that was extremely interesting too. You know, we, we don't know what a mind that isn't hyper-civilized, let's say, hyper-literate like, like our minds are because we're so bombarded by external stimuli. We have no idea what the natural mind is like, really. And so it was quite interesting to... to to listen to that and, and also to see the consequences because he's quite a great he's quite a great carver. So the first is ecstatic, dreams, trances, visions. The second is traditional, shamanic techniques, names and functions of the spirits, mythology and genealogy of the clan, a secret language. This twofold teaching imparted by the spirits and the old master shamans constitutes initiation. Well, so you know, modern people have a problem with that because we don't really get initiated, but I would say that, you know, let's say that we're each on a quest of some sort. You wouldn't be here, I don't think, if, if you weren't, because why else would you be here? And so you're on a quest of some sort to figure out, to struggle with the meaning of life, let's say. And you don't want to do that alone because you only last like 70 years, and good luck figuring it out on your, on your own. It's just not going to happen. It's too complicated. And you'll be too isolated, right, if, if it's just you. That's insanity. That's, no one can stand that. And so you hope that other people have things to tell you and that your culture has something to tell you, you know? So you're on a quest, maybe not with the same intensity as a shamanic initiate, but, you know, let's give you some credit. And then you're also trying to understand the wisdom of the past. And that's the second part of this. It's like, okay, well, you're a human being, and human beings have been telling stories for a long period of time, trying to figure out what's going on, trying to figure out how to orient themselves in the world. And so, you know, Partly what you're doing here is exactly what the shamanic initiate does in the second part of the process, which is to expose yourself to the degree that you can to names and functions of the spirits, mythology and genealogy of the clan, and the secret language. This twofold teaching imparted by the spirits and the old master shamans constitutes initiation. 
So it's, that's rebirth, right? You, that's, that's what a initiation is. It's being born again. And, and that's a birth of the spirit rather than of the body. It's something like that. And so it's the rebirth of an integrated psyche. That's one way of thinking about it. And a psyche that's, that's individual, but also grounded in co common humanity, in the wisdom of common humanity. And that makes you strong. Or at least it makes you stronger. Because there's a limit to your strength. But God only knows to some degree what that limit is. You know, people can be unbelievably tough. Unbelievably tough. And I think it's even the more admirable for human beings to be tough because we're so conscious of how we can be hurt. And we're so conscious of what that hurt can lead to. You know, you can have your family taken away from you and you can be destroyed. And the fact that you can be courageous in the face of that at all is something that is absolutely unbelievable. Right? And people deserve a lot more credit, I think, than people give themselves. Because the fact that we can be honorable under conditions of life and death, right, of suffering, that's, that's a testament to the human spirit. And there's a profound anti-human ethos, I think, that pervades our culture, you know, that considers human beings cancers on the planet, something like that, you know. And that there should be less of us, it's the same spirit that motivated the guy who wrote the book about it better to have never been. And it's like, I don't see it that way, you know, I mean, I think people do pretty well for you know, for having their leg caught in a bear trap and their head caught in a vice, they're actually doing pretty well because life is really hard and the fact that we're not absolutely brutal and murderous all the time is really something remarkable given what we actually have to contend with, that we can go out of our way to be honest and generous and altruistic and to care for each other under unbelievably dire circumstances and to act nobly sometimes under the most trying conditions, you know, and Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, he tells story after story of people who acted abysmally, but also people who, under the worst threats imaginable, never sacrificed their character. You know, and reading about that is really... Well, it really makes you wonder. That's, that's what it does. The future shamans among the Tungus, as they approach maturity, go through a hysterical or a hysteroid crisis, but sometimes their vocation manifests itself at an earlier age. The boy runs away into the mountains and remains there for a week or more, feeding on animals which he tears to pieces with his teeth. He returns to the village, filthy, blood-stained, and it's only after ten or more days that have passed that he begins to babble incoherent words. The strange behavior of future shamans has not failed to attract the attention of scholars and from the middle of the past century several attempts have been made to explain the phenomena as a mental disorder. But the problem was wrongly put. For on the one hand it is not true that shamans always are or always have to be neuropathic, in, mentally deranged. On the other hand, and this is the critical issue, those among them who had been ill become shamans precisely because they had succeeded in becoming cured. So it was, it's not the descent into this strange subterranean psychological state that constitutes the transformation that makes the shaman, but it's the emergence back out of that. And that's a journey to the underworld and a, and a rebirth, right? And so, and there's this great book, this is a great book, by a guy named Henry Ellenberger, and he was an existential uh, psychoanalyst and philosopher, and he wrote a book called The Discovery of the Unconscious, which I would highly recommend. It's on my list of recommended readings. It is a great book. If you want to know about the psychoanalytic tradition. Uh, it's the best introduction there is. And he discusses Adler and Jung and Freud and does a very credible job of all three, but also takes the history of psychoanalytic thought back three or four hundred years before Freud. And so it's, it's very engaging reading and, 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 and very interesting. And one of the things Alan Berger points out quite clearly is, and, and he associates this to some degree with the shamanic tradition, that both Freud and Jung Jung, in particular, underwent very intense periods of psychological disturbance, let's say. And I would say what was happening is that because they were questioning their axioms at the most fundamental level, they were deranging their cognitive and perceptual structures, right? And Jung was also experimenting with imaginative techniques, with visionary techniques, which he, which he did a lot. And there was a period of his life where he was having constant a constant stream of visions, which he wrote down in a book called The Red Book. But at the same time, he was still functioning as a psychiatrist and operating normally in the world. And so, you know, people have 
suggested that what he had was a psychotic break, but that's ridiculous because you don't, don't <laughs> that's not how it works, man. If you're having a psychotic break, you, you're not being an effective psychiatrist. Those things do not go together, especially not for a long period of time. And so there, there's the possibility of extreme experience without psychos, psychopathology. And so, um, and Ellen Berger, he says much the same thing about Freud, and about Charles Darwin as well, who underwent a terrible period of, of, of mental confusion, I would say, as a consequence of formulating his theory of evolution, which was really hard on him, because he, he was a die-hard Christian, and he knew what... He knew what the implications of his theory were. He didn't know what to do about that, you know, so it was very, very hard on him. So it's quite common for people of genius to go through an intense crisis, psychological crisis, but then resolve it, and the genius is in the resolution, right? The precondition for the genius is the dissolution in some sense, because you have to be obsessed with a problem. It has to grip you completely before you're going to concentrate on it so obsessively that you might come up with a solution. But it's the people who come up with a solution that are the prophets and the shaman and so forth and so on. And, and, and so that's not, this isn't something that only characterizes archaic cultures. We just don't recognize it in our own culture properly. And, and that's a problem. Well, sometimes we do. Right, you remember that in, in, in The Lion King, right? That Rafiki shows up, he's the shaman, he, he, he brings, he brings uh, Simba down that tunnel, dark tunnel, that's the dark night of the soul. He has him reflect upon himself in a pool. When he reflects upon himself deeply, he sees the reflection of his father. Then that becomes a thing of cosmic significance. And his father appears in the sky, just like... God appears to Jacob and basically tells him that it's time for him to grow the hell up and to return to the devastated kingdom and to set it right. You know, and so, and that's right. That's exactly right. I mean, we live in the devastated kingdom. That's an eternal truth. And it's the responsibility of the individual to grow the hell up and to set it right. Because when it's devastated and when things are not in place, then everyone suffers too much. And that's not good. And there's no excuse for not doing something about it, because you don't have anything better to do. So, and even, like, children's movies tell you this. So, this is a fun one. This is from the Eadwine Psalter, 9th to 12th century, and that's Adam and Eve, but the, there is speculation that the fruit that they're eating there, you see, is psilocybin mushrooms. Right, because they're the only kind of mushroom that grow like that. So that's pretty wild, you might say. And then this is the, I think it's called Banisteria vine, if I remember correctly, and it's what ayahuasca is made out of, and it has this double helix form, which is very, very interesting. And they, the people, the natives, nobody could figure out how the hell they made this ayahuasca, which, which transports people spiritually in a very intense manner. And there's a whole religion based on it, like a modern religion as well as the archaic religion. And to, to, to make this stuff, they had to take two plants that don't grow anywhere near each other. And like there's like a million plants in the Amazon, so like how do you figure that out? Nobody knows. And then you have to cook them in this very particular way for a particular amount of time before you produce this stuff. So one of the plants has DMT in it, which is a very intense psychedelic, but it's very short-acting. And the other has an MAO inhibitor. So if you take the DMT and you take the MAO inhibitor, then the DMT trip lasts for much longer. And so that's what these Amazonian natives figured out. And no one has any idea how they managed it. And if you ask them, they tell you that the plants told them how to do it, which isn't much of an explanation as far as modern people are concerned. But then when modern people take the ayahuasca and the plant so to speak, starts to talk to them, they're a little less leery of the whole theory that the plants had something to do with this. So, you know, and these things, that these, I'm loath to talk about this because I'm not an advocate for drug use. But by the same token, you can't ignore empirical data. It's not reasonable. And the empirical data that psychedelic substances can produce mystical experiences and that those often have a transformative effect. I mean, one of the latest studies showed that if you took people who were dying of cancer and you and you gave them psilocybin in a sufficient dose to produce a mystical experience that you radically it decreased their, their fear of death. It's like, you got to think about that, man. That's, that's tough. That's a tough experiment. You, you just wouldn't expect that. To, you think, you take someone, you derange them intensely, 
and then when they come back, they're not, even though they're dying, they're not nearly as afraid of dying. You know, you, you got to kind of wake up and smell the roses when you see something like that. And the people who are doing this research are very reliable people. So, there's the Amanita muscaria. You know, there's this old idea, it's quite a funny idea, toadstools. So, flies like Amanita muscaria. And there's some, this is ridiculous, there's some evidence that they actually like getting stoned. So, because animals will eat these, like reindeer will eat these things too, and they get pretty tripped out by them. And so I have this book on psychedelic use among animals, which is a small book, but... <laughs> and so, <laughs> so there's, there's this idea that toads used to sit around the, the Amanita muscaria and wait for the stone flies to, like, buzz badly around them and then snap them up. So, that's pretty funny, I think, and so... And, you know, there are mushrooms in, in the U.S. that are the oldest, the oldest organisms on the planet. Hey, there's one mushroom, I can't remember where it is, but it covers something like, oh God, I don't know, like square, hundreds of square miles. It's like this huge thing, because it's all underground, right? And they have these very complex networks of, of mycelia, they're called. And they think the thing is like 150,000 years old, something like that. So, there's plenty of things about the world that we don't know, that's for sure. There's the, the chemical makeup of the classic psychedelics. You see, they all have the same fundamental structure. This is serotonin. That's the, one of the major brain neurotransmitters. And so what happens with the psychedelics is that they, they, alter, the, they alter the brain function by altering the, the neurochemical utilization of serotonin. They change the manner in which the serotonergic systems work. And that is a, the serotonin system is a very basic system, because eh? when you're an embryo, and your brain is developing, it's the serotonin projections that basically orchestrate the development of your brain. So they're, and they're very archaic circuits, very, very archaic circuits. So, and this is the paper, I think I stole this from, uh, psilocybin Griffiths, who's been doing a lot of this research, psilocybin can occasion mystical type experiences having substantial and sustained personal meaning and spiritual significance. So, why? That's a good question, right? Like, so, so here's a question for you. It is beyond dispute that human beings are capable of religious experience. Why? Why is that, exactly? And like, you can associate it with psychosis, but that doesn't work. Because the theory doesn't hold, the theory doesn't hold water. It's not the same thing. So why is it there, exactly? And it, it's not an easy thing to figure out. Like, I've been trying to figure... I'm always trying to figure out a biological explanation for everything, right? Because if you want to find something to stand on, you want to make sure that it can resist a challenge. And so if I can find an explanation for something that's reductionistic and materialistic and biological, then I'm going for that. But that's a tough one. Consciousness is a tough one. The, the moral sense is a tough one. They're not easy things to crack. The Big Bang is a tough one. So... You know, I mean, a cynic might say that maybe sometimes when people are close to suicide, they'll have a mystical experience, you know. And you, maybe you say, well, it's a last-ditch attempt of your brain to delude you into thinking that your life has some significance, you know. And that, that's a plausible theory, but I don't think it accounts for the generality of the phenomena. So, so I don't buy it. What happens in the shamanic experience is that the, the shaman has the experience of being reduced to a skeleton first. So, death, a death experience, a very realistic death experience. And then, the next thing that happens is that he finds himself in a place where he's communing with his ancestral, the ancestral spirits. And then, after that, there's the climbing of something like the ladder, Jacob's ladder, say and an encounter with God, for all intents and purposes. And uh, it's very widespread um, phenomena. It's the world tree, and I, I've thought about this a lot, trying to figure out what this, what this represents. According to a Yakut informant, that, that's in Siberia, the spirits carry the future shaman to hell and shut him in a house for three years. Here he undergoes his initiation. The spirits cut off his head, which they set off to one side, for the novice must watch his own dismemberment with his own eyes. 
dissolution to the primary elements in some sense and hack his body to bits which are later distributed among the spirits of various sicknesses it's only on this condition that the future shaman will obtain the power of healing his bones are then covered with new flesh and in some case he is also given new blood so there's a death and resurrection experience that's associated with the shamanic ritual we're here in the presence of a very ancient religious idea which belongs to the hunter culture Bone symbolizes the final root of animal life, the mold from which the flesh continually rises. It is from the bone that men and animals are reborn for a time. They maintain themselves in an existence of the flesh, then they die. And their life is reduced to the essence concentrated in the skeleton from which they will be born again. That's a good graphic representation of the experience. <clears throat> 